In this lesson, we'll look at um, the different kinds of metals available for metal casting. We'll cover both ferrous as well as non-ferrous materials. In particular, we'll look at their properties, their applications, and also we'll kind of look at the compatibility with which process uh, for each material, each class of material. So if you look at a classification of metals, you have uh, on the ferrous side, we have cast iron, carbon steels, and stainless steels. Within car cast iron, we have most popular is gray iron and a little bit of malleable iron. And these days, increasingly, we also have ductile iron, also called as ferroidal graphite iron. Now, within gray, we have low, medium, and high carbon gray iron. And within ductile iron, we have either ferritic on one side, pearlitic on the other side, and combinations of ferritic and pearlitic depending on which phase is in higher quantities. In steels, we have we classify either as plain, medium, or high carbon steel, or low alloy or a high alloy carbon steel. Within stainless steels, we have again austenitic, ferritic, martensitic, and um, different kind of steels depending on their the treatments or uh, availability in the industry. Now, this is the most uh, common uh, uh, phase diagram. Almost all students learn this. So, if you look at the iron carbon phase diagram, we have this liquidus line at the top, which is uh, defining above which the, uh, the metal is in liquid uh, shape. And then you have a between liquidus and solidus line, you have what's called a mushy zone, a combination of liquid and solid. And then when it comes down to room temperature, it depending on how the casting is solidifying, you can have a ferritic at one end, pearlitic at, other, at the middle, and then cemented at the other end, depending on the, the way it is solidifies and the, in the in essentially cooling rates, and also the amount of graphite and how the graphite takes form, basically. Now, the, the, the type of microstructure okay, and the phases in, included in the microstructure and the distribution of phases and the way the phases are interrelated with each other defines the properties. So, on one hand, you have at, at a macro level is where we are interested in, let's say, tensile strength and hardness properties. At the other end, if you look at micro, we are looking at how the microscopic phases, constitutions affect each other. At nano level, you start looking at the each individual grains and, and boundaries of the grains. Meso comes in between micro and macro. We say meso as for referring to a scale which is between microscopic scale and a microscopic scale. Now, you look at uh, cast and ductile iron. We have several phases here. Uh, and depending on the composition and the strength, these are designated as in case of uh, gray iron, we talk, we say uh, Fg and 220 refers to the tensile strength in megapascals. So, you have 220, 260, 300, these are some of the widely used gray irons. In Sg iron or ductile iron, again similarly you have, you may have 400, 600, 800, these are only some of the various grades, you can have many more in between these numbers. Okay. Yeah, that's basically uh, coming out of the treatment uh, or conversion of SG, uh, gray iron into ductile iron. Essentially, the strength of gray iron is low because the graphite or carbon is in a flake form. And uh, remember that graphite essentially is a very weak material compared to iron. So, when it's in a flake form, it creates sites for easy fracture. So, tensile strength is not very high. When you treat gray iron with, let's say, magnesium or cerium, these uh, graphites take the form of spheres or spheroids. Okay. The moment it becomes spheroids, the tensile strength increases because now it cannot crack or rupture so very easily. The, the benefit is almost is significant. If you see the strength of, uh, of uh, as we will see, I will show you the next slide. If you see the strength of the gray irons is in the range of 200 to 300, okay, whereas tactile irons are almost double of that. So, that is a big difference you make with the same composition, just by adding a little bit of magnesium, cerium and treating with that, you are doubling the properties. That is one of the reasons of popularity of ductile iron. In fact, ductile iron has, you know, if you look at cast iron, why it is popular as a casting material? Because it is easy to cast, temperature is low, it flows very nicely and all that. On the other hand, if you look at steel, it is much less easy to cast, but of course, it has very, very good strength properties, very good mechanical properties. So, ductile iron with the ease of cast iron, you are getting a benefit in terms of higher strength by doing those treatments. That is the reason why ductile iron is becoming very popular. At low cost, you get higher strength. Okay, so, this is the strength of, uh, remember strength is in a range. 
finally the actual strength depends on the the wall thickness and the way the cooling rates are the grains that are formed so your always strength is in a range of values and you should look at if you want to look at nominal you take the average values for any calculation purpose okay so also in this table you find to see, you see the the solidus and liquidus temperature so if you see most of the irons are poured around 1200 degrees maybe little more than that if it's a high grade ductile iron now the applications of gray and ductile iron if you look at uh, gray iron you use them in in pla uh, places wherever you you the strength requirement is not so high and uh, they also have good uh, damping characteristics good wear characteristics okay but not very hardness not very high strength there you get gray iron whereas if you look at ductile iron whenever you have you, when you want a combination of low cost combined with high strength and a little bit of high hardness also you start looking at ductile iron so if you see look at things like bulldozer parts okay and turret heads you need a combination of high dimensional stability high strength high hardness and ductile iron is a better bet there then you look at steels and within steels you have uh, as we said before you have low medium and high carbon and low alloy or high alloy uh, car, uh, stay steels stainless steels are one of those most popular because they have uh, not only high strength but also high corrosion resistant and because of that they have a large number of applications in uh, from things like food processing industry to 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 medical industry uh, medical or surgical appliances are made by uh, using stainless steel Uh, if you look at the mechanical properties, these now you now you see a significant increase in properties compared to irons. So thanks to removal of sulphur and phosphorus and few other uh, elements in iron, you are getting now and alloy making, adding alloys, alloying elements to this, you get fantastic high high strength, high wear resistance, and high corrosion resistance for steels. Okay, the price you pay for steels is that the pouring temperatures are high, the melting temperature is high, so pouring temperature is high is it goes up to if you look at actual pouring temperature it goes up to 1550 1600 or even above that now that can create problems because most cupolas operate at the most at 12 1200 1300 good for irons but the moment you talk about steels you have to switch to induction furnace and arc furnace and other furnaces so that's the price you pay steels are not very easy to handle that additional 12 200 degree centigrade pouring temperature from iron to steel um, makes it much more difficult to pour and melt and pour and handle that castings application of steels we just mentioned that if you look at carbon they are wide variety of industrial applications machine tool parts and so on uh, but uh, if you look at stainless steels we are talking about now household appliances and all kinds of uh, surgical instruments i mentioned aircraft in aircraft wherever corrosion high strength are required you start looking at stainless steels but remember these are much more expensive than irons sometimes more than twice now we look at non ferrous metals classification when you say non ferrous most of the non ferrous metals essentially essentially are aluminum alloys followed immediately by a little bit of by copper and then you are talking about nickel magnesium zinc and other alloys so within aluminum alloys aluminum combined with other non ferrous elements gives you either aluminum copper alloys aluminum silicon copper alloys or aluminum silicon alloys only very popular okay because that's that's a higher strength than aluminum alone then aluminum magnesium alloys and aluminum uh, later on we'll say titanium alloys which have high weight uh, high strength to weight ratio okay so you can look at aluminum in terms of you want high strength to weight or high strength alone at a low cost okay or a little bit of corrosion resistance you can have various common in fact the number of aluminum alloys is is in hundreds here we're listing only the major ones similarly copper is good for not only high strength but also high corrosion resistance so if you have copper and zinc is uh, and copper and uh, uh, sorry brass and then you have bronzes various bronzes whether it's aluminum bronze or phosphor bronze silicon bronze or tin bronze which is uh, the traditional bronze here so we have uh, and each one of these has its own properties and so on i will not go in details here because you can refer to go back to books for different to that the last uh, uh, popular non ferrous alloy is nickel based alloys most of these are called as super alloys because these are really good for high strength and coupled with high temperature applications so if you look at let's say nickel chromium or let us say your uh, monel which is nickel and copper all these are so for the nickel chromium for example is used in turbine blade applications which have which need very high strength and 
have, have to operate at a very high temperatures. No other metal can actually withstand that kind of temperatures and stresses as a turbine blade. Okay. So, now aluminum alloys we need to understand the phase diagram of aluminum silicon because this is the most common non ferrous alloy which is used in casting. So, if you see on the left side you have silicon 0 percent, aluminum 100 percent. On the right side you have aluminum 0 percent and silicon 100 percent. And if you see uh, around 12 percent you have aluminum silicon eutectic and eutectics are characterized by a single melting point. Essentially we say freezing range is 0 because unlike other compositions which are compositions of the alloy where you have a range of freezing temperatures here it is single point. So, this eutectic composition although it is an alloy behaves like a pure metal in terms of melting in the sense that it has a single melting point. Uh, what you see on the bottom also is the typical grain structure of aluminum silicon alloys from pure aluminum almost pure aluminum and pure silicon to the eutectic composition there. Uh, no, for middle one is the 50 percent silicon composition. Now, here are some typical aluminum and copper alloys which are used popularly and you can see the major constituents are silicon, copper, magnesium, phosphorus, manganese and lead and then uh, tin and zinc. Okay. But most of the major alloys we talk about silicon and copper as the main constituents. Okay. So, this is as per the international standards. Now, if you look at the properties of those aluminum alloys, you notice that as you move from aluminum copper uh, to towards uh, magnesium, more magnesium and towards bronzes which is more copper, the strength will increase anywhere from starting from 240 to 62 all the way to more than 300 there. Uh, hardness is not very high. So, remember that aluminum alloys are not really meant for high strength applications, they are more meant for uh, structural elements where you do not need, so, where strength is not a major criterion. Now, aluminum alloys are characterized by low density, whereas the moment you talk about copper, you are looking at very high density. In fact, it approaches or even exceeds that of iron. So, the copper is a very heavy, heavy metal. But in terms of melting temperatures, most of these will be, uh, if it is aluminum, it is below 700, below 800 definitely. If it is copper, it is around 1000 or so. So, we are all, these are all low melting point uh, alloys. Applications wise, if, if you look at those four or five um, major metals, uh, aluminum you can start looking at and especially aluminum, silicon, copper, cylinder blocks and cylinder heads, okay, various aircraft fittings, okay, various casings, exhaust systems, these are popular because there are structural elements where you need to cover it, you need to reduce the weight, but it does not need any strength requirement. A casing does not need any strength, it, it just has to apply, it has to cover an area. So, there aluminum is a great thing because you are weight reducing on saving on the weight. Whereas, the moment you talk about aluminum magnesium alloys, it is a, it's an aircraft or aerospace material because it has very high strength to weight application. Except for when you talk about turbine blades, you, where you need also high strength at high temperatures, we switch to uh, super alloys. The copper based metals uh, alloys are very good for uh, not only good corrosion resistance, but also for good bearing properties. So, marine applications where you need high corrosion or various bearings where you need high uh, low friction, copper is a metal of choice or copper based alloys are the metal of choice. Now, this is important. What we look at here is the various uh, metals which you talked about, ferrous as well as non-ferrous, especially focusing on aluminum because that is the most popular non-ferrous metal, the suitability for different processes. So, if you look at things like sand cast, sand based processes which are the top three band, the, the brown. Uh, sand casting processes are good for any metal because sand has a very high, um, uh, very high fusion point. Whereas, if you see the bottom three which is the blue, these are metal based, metal mold based processes. The mold is made up of usually steel. Now, you cannot pour steel and then pour into a steel mold because the mold will get damaged. So, you have to obviously pour less uh, metals with lower melting points into the steel molds. So, if you see the last uh, bunch, last bottom uh, right corner, the aluminum alloys and metal molds go very happily together. Similarly, if you look at the top uh, uh, quadrant, top left quadrant, sand and ferrous goes very well together because sand has a very high fusion point, it can happily take the ferrous metals which have a higher melting point. 
Okay. In between which we still look at things like lost wax investment casting process or a lost foam process which essentially poly polyurethane foam uh, being used to create the sand mold or replicas where the foam is burnt off and creating a cavity. These are also good for most metals except that in terms of industrial applicability because in the investment casting is a little more tricky process and is meant for uh, thin walls and let us say uh, metals which are difficult to machine the combination of investment casting and let us say stainless steel works out very nicely. So, stainless steel is difficult to machine and investment casting is good for creating a parts with um, thin walls and, and very low uh, very good surface finish and high tolerances. So, you do not need to machine those parts near net shape parts. So, a combination of investment casting and stainless steel works out very well. So, most surgical instruments for example are made by investment casting of uh, stainless steel. Yeah. Yeah, so cross definitely means not possible okay, or not used for various maybe economical reason. A tick mark obviously means it is very good for that and we have a green tick mark and red cross. The orange dash means that it is perhaps possible. Okay. So, if you say here we said the cast iron and gravity die casting we put a dash which means that it is neither impossible nor it is widely used. It is possible but not very widely used. Why is that? The reason we just now said is that gravity die is made up of a steel mold and then in steel mold if you put iron the mold life is not going to be very high. But what when you said dash here which means it is possible by putting very active and heavy cooling in the die okay, we can uh, put cooling channels and force water through that and maybe cool water through that. By doing that we can bring the die temperature down enough that you can pour cast iron into that. Except that die becomes hot after you pour it, it takes long time for the die to cool down and then so the, sh the next shot has to be delayed long enough. But it is feasible that people have poured cast iron into steel molds, but it is not a very popular process, not a very economical process, not a very productive process, but it is technically definitely feasible. Okay, so, we go along and uh, summarize this lesson. So, what we looked at is that um, you have essentially ferrous metals and non ferrous metals. Ferrous metals as you have seen little earlier in another lesson are the most popular almost more than 80 percent of metals cast all over the world are ferrous metals by weight remember that. Non ferrous metals also are popular and led by aluminum, aluminum is, uh, is the most common non ferrous metal which is cast. Okay. Aluminum is the most popular non ferrous metal which is cast and remember by volume aluminum is of course much more because density wise it is almost one third to two, I mean about one third of, of let us say steel. And um, then we looked at classification of metals, most many classification uh, schemes uh, indirectly use the strength itself as a classification mode. And then we see that uh, the strength increases from cast iron as a thumb rule 200 MPa to ductile iron about 400 MPa to steel about 700-800 mega Pascals. So, that is the difference between grey iron and ductile iron and steel. And we said grey iron, ductile iron is great because with a little bit of addition of to, to grey iron we are getting fantastic properties here. So, we looked at other major non ferrous alloys are based upon copper and magnesium and zinc and titanium and nickel based super alloys we looked at that. And the applications of these metals essentially depend on mechanical properties, but also physical and chemical properties which we will review in the next lesson. And then uh, which process is good for which metal depends really on the, the primary de uh, decision factor here is the the melting point of the metal number one and number two is how long the metal can flow which we will see in another lesson and the other characteristics properties which you can achieve by the combination of metal and the process. Okay, so, with this we will close this lesson.